Good morning, church family. I wanted to share with you a few observations from Genesis chapter 21. Uh, as most of you know, we uh, on Wednesday nights, we are studying through the book of Genesis. And so I'm, I'm trying to share with you just uh, at least a few minutes uh, of, you know, a study. Uh, we're not going as in-depth in our videos because uh, normally I have much longer to teach. But uh, I want to share just a couple of observations with you from Genesis chapter 21. And so I just want to look at the first eight verses. These first eight verses are finally the, the fulfillment of a great promise that God made to Abraham. If you've been in this study, uh, we've been waiting on the fulfillment of this promise for uh, a long time. Uh, not, not as long as Abraham. Abraham's been waiting 25 or 30 years, but we've been waiting since chapter 12. Uh, it seems like a long time, though. Uh, it's been a few months since we read chapter 12. But finally, uh, his son Isaac is born in Genesis chapter 21, verses 1 through 8. And so I want to read those verses to you and just share just a few observations with you. But it says, uh, beginning in verse 1, Then the Lord took note of Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at the appointed time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, Sarah, uh, who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. Then Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, and God had commanded him, as God had commanded him. Now Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has made laughter for me. Everyone who hears will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. The child grew, was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was, was weaned. And so just a few observations uh, from those eight verses. We can learn some great things, mainly about God. Um, Abraham and Sarah certainly learned several lessons about God. One of the very first things they learned about God was obviously that God keeps his promises. Um, you know, if you've been with me as we've studied through these chapters, <clears throat> you know that uh, they haven't perfectly believed God's promise of a son. Uh, there have been times when they were very faithful in their belief. There were times when they showed a, kind of a partial belief. Uh, there were times when they took matters into their own hands, trying to, maybe they thought God needed help in fulfilling this promise. But God was faithful. He fulfilled this promise in spite of their lack of belief at times. And so we know that God uh, will, will fulfill his promises. And I think about all the promises that are in the Bible for Christians. Now, you know, there somebody has said one time there are over 7,000 promises in the Bible. Now, not all of them are for you and me. That's why context is important. But uh, there are probably hundreds and hundreds of promises that are for Christians and I can't help but think about, you know, the promise of Jesus to come and take the church, you and me, out of this world to live with him for all of eternity, uh, to live in a perfect place uh, in his presence where there's no sickness and no sorrow and, and, and we're no longer in the presence of sin. And, and so that's a promise that we can trust that God, even, even though it hasn't been fulfilled yet, we know that God will keep that promise. So they learn that God keeps his promises, but they also learn that God is an all-powerful God. Um, they learn that nothing is too hard for him, and that's really emphasized in this passage of Scripture. And we see it in the, those first two verses. Listen to this. It says, The Lord took note of Sarah as he had said. The Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Notice this is, this is all about God. So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the appointed time which God had spoken of. See, the emphasis is on God. God is the one who had the power to make this happen. Because human speaking, humanly speaking, uh, it was impossible for Abraham and Sarah to bear children. They were just past childbearing age. But God was the one who made this possible because God is all-powerful. God is sovereign. God can do whatever he wants to do. This is his world. And he can do what he wants to do. So they learn that God is a promise keeper. They learn that God is all powerful. The hardest lesson that they probably learned and is probably the hardest lesson for us to learn is that 
many times God's not in a hurry with some of his promises. In other words, God has a time to fulfill his promises. God's never early, he's never late. He has a perfect timing. And we see this with um, the promise of Isaac. Um, you know, they, they worried and fretted and tried to, you know, do their own thing to make it come to pass. But God had a perfect timing when it came to uh, the fulfillment of this promised son. And I think many times we do the same thing. We, we pray about something and we, we feel like, you know, God may answer that, prom that prayer for us. And, but we don't want to wait. And, and we, we fret and we worry. We take matters into our own hand. And that's wrong because what we're doing is we're it's showing that we have a lack of faith. We, we have a lack in either that, that uh, believing that uh, we don't believe God can do what we're asking him to do. Are we showing a lack in faith as far as trusting God's timing? Uh, so we just need to believe that God is all powerful. God fulfills his promises and God has perfect timing. So those are some lessons that um, Abraham and Sarah learned. And I think that are good lessons for us to learn as well. But I want to make a comparison before we leave the passage. And that is a comparison between Isaac and our Savior Jesus. One of the things you'll see as we study through this passage or actually through the life of Isaac, there are a lot of parallels between his life and the life of Jesus. It's almost like Isaac is, uh, is kind of a foreshadow, foreshadowing of our Savior. Um, like especially when Abraham takes Isaac to Mount Moriah to sacrifice him. Remember God asked him to sacrifice his one and only son. Of course, they get there. Um, God provides a sacrifice. Abraham names the place uh, that God will provide. But, but that's pointing us to Jesus. That's pointing us to the cross. So there are a lot of things in Isaac's life that point us to Jesus. And there are a lot of similarities in their births or parallels in their births. So let me give you a, an example of several. First of all, Isaac and Jesus were both the promised seed or son. Uh, we, we, you know this from Isaac. This is obvious. We've studied this for the last few months. But, but Jesus as well. Uh, you know, the Old Testament is filled with prophecies and promises of the coming Messiah, the promised son, the promised seed. Uh, another parallel is that uh, there was a period of delay between the promise and the fulfillment. Isaac uh, wasn't real long, 25, 30 years, with Jesus much longer but there was both a delay, a delay in both uh, of, of the promise and the birth of these two. Uh, another parallel is that um, when Sarah heard about the birth or that she would give birth to Isaac, here's what she thought or what she said. This is Genesis 18, 13. She said, will I really have a child now that I'm old? And listen to what God said to her in verse 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Now that should remind you of a passage of scripture in the New Testament because we find a very similar thing when the birth of Jesus is announced to Mary. Mary says, how will this be since I am a virgin? And the angel who is announcing this to her says, nothing is impossible with God. So we see some very, very close similarities here in the birth of Isaac and the birth of our Savior. Uh, another similarity is the names of the children were symbolic and they were both given before they were born. God told Abraham in Genesis 17 verse 19, your wife Sarah will bear a son. You will call him Isaac. And then God told Joseph in Matthew chapter 1 verse 21, she will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save the people from their sins. Now a fifth uh, parallel is that their births occurred at God's appointed time. Uh, and I think this is really interesting because we've already seen how this is, this is very emphasized, really emphasized in the birth of Isaac. But Paul emphasizes this in the birth of Christ in Galatians chapter four, verse four, where he says, but when the time had fully come, in other words, that perfect time, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive the full rights of, son, of sons. So when the time had fully come, so just like the birth of Isaac, the birth of Jesus was not, was it too early? Was it too late? It was in God's very perfect timing, exactly when God wanted it to be.
What one more uh, parallel or, or similarity in, in these two births? The birth of Jesus um, is like the birth of Isaac in that it required a miracle. Both of these births required a miracle. Now, I think Jesus' birth was the greater miracle because it required conception without the benefit of a human father. Uh, but that was a, a, a great miracle, the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. But the birth of Isaac was a miracle because here you have two uh, uh, humans, a man and a woman, who are well past childbearing age. And so uh, there had to be the restoring of the reproductive power in this elderly couple. And that's a miracle as well. So we see that similarity. So I thought that was kind of interesting. So th this brings me to another comparison. We've, we've compared the birth of Isaac to the birth of Jesus, but we can kind of compare the birth of Isaac to our new birth, our spiritual birth. Um, what I'm talking about is uh, we see this in the words of, of Paul. And if you have your a Bible handy, you can turn to Romans chapter 4 and verses 18 through 25. And Paul is talking about Abraham and his faith. And so, so let me read this to you, uh, beginning in verse 18. Now remember, Paul's talking about Abraham. It says, in hope against hope, he believed, Abraham believed so that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which had, had been spoken, so shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about a 100 years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully assured that what God had promised God was going to be able to also perform. Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness. Now, not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was uh, he who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. So the, the, the language in these, ver in, in these verses is, is really involved. I mean, there's a lot here, but the obvious main point is pretty evident. And that is, first of all, the birth of Isaac was humanly impossible because Abraham and Sarah were both dead as far as their ability to produce new life. Uh, was concerned. And this is precisely what the Bible teaches about our new birth. Uh, we are dead in our trespasses and sin. There, you know, you and I can, can no more um, resurrect our spiritual life or, you know, cause a new birth spiritually than a, than a corpse can uh, uh, regain its own life. Um, so that has to be a miracle. But, but secondly, Abraham believed God's promise for a son. Notice what he says in verse 21. It says that Abraham was fully assured of what God had promised. He was able to perform. Um, so Abraham knew that this birth would have to come from God. God had promised it would happen. Now, Abraham's 100 years old, but God, uh, Abraham fully believed God would do this, even though Abraham knew it was completely impossible. And this is, this is what Jesus meant when he was speaking with Nicodemus. And he told Nicodemus, he said, listen, if you want to see the kingdom of God, you must be born again. You must be born of water and spirit. You must be born from above. In other words, this is something God's going to have to do because it's humanly impossible. Third, the passage in Romans shows why salvation uh, is like this. Uh, because in verse 20, it talks about God getting all of the glory. It says in verse 20, he who was delivered over because of our transgressions was raised because of our justification. Um, sorry, I read the wrong verse. I had the wrong verse written down. Uh, it, it says, um, verse, verse 20 says, Yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God. That's the verse I meant to read. And, and so th that, that's the way our salvation is designed, um, so that we give glory to God for it. See, if Abraham and Sarah were still able to reproduce, 
and have children, then the birth of Isaac would have been to their credit. They would have been given credit for that. They would have been given all the glory for that. But now because they are both too old and humanly impossible for them to reproduce, who gets all the glory? God does. And in the same way with our new birth, our regeneration, our salvation, it is humanly impossible for us to do this. And so there's no way that sinful man or sinful woman could get the glory for our salvation. God gets all the glory for your salvation. So we see that parallel as well. Romans uh, verses 23 and 24 also tell us that the events of Abraham's life were not written for him alone. It says, now not for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sake also to whom it will be credited as those who believe in him who raised Jesus from the dead. So, you know, the primary reason for studying the life of Abraham is that you might believe in the God who does miracles, mainly the miracle of saving it, of the new birth. You see, all of us need a miracle. Everyone needs a miracle. And God does miracles. He does the miracle of saving you, of giving you that new birth. And, you know, a, a secondary reason we study the life of Abraham is to encourage us as believers to live by faith as Abraham lived by faith. So those are just a few observations that we got from Genesis chapter 21. I hope that you found some things to be encouraging in that passage as well. Hope to see you soon and have a blessed day.